Hey, turn to Luke chapter 7, everybody. Luke chapter 7. If you got your Bible, come on, let me see you wave your Bible at me. If you got your paper Bible, come on, you can smell that Bible. Come on, just smell that leather real Bible if you got it. If you have a cell phone, don't smell that. Um, But something about just a real Bible. Got your Bible, open Bible, open notes. Now, if you have your cell phone and you got your Bible on your cell phone, wave your cell phone at me. We read the Bible on our cell phone. Luke chapter 7, verse 36 through 50. We're going to read this story. Before we read, let's pray. God, we open your word uh, with excitement and with expectation. For God, most of us, we would, we would love if you would speak to us audibly. There are things in our life where we would crave for you to just talk to us face to face, and we would beg for that. But God, here's the crazy thing, and we want to remind ourselves of this today, is that when we open your word, it is you speaking to us. And through the power of your Holy Spirit and the power of your word, as both of those things are present today, we can get a real-time relevant, life-changing word from you to our lives today. And God, that's what I pray would happen over these next few moments is that we would encounter your word, that we would encounter the direction of your word, the clarity of your word, the power of your word, the conviction of your word, the encouragement of your word as we read it together. We're gathered around it like a team would be gathered around a playbook. And we're about to say ready break as we go into the rest of our lives and live out the words that you've called us to live. God, we continue to pray for the Washington Redskins as um, we are very fearful of the upcoming season, but we just pray that somehow in a miraculous way we would make some um, significant and, um, and, and positive moves to the roster and um, so that we can win more than five games this year. Thank you, Jesus. And we just, we just, we do believe for a Super Bowl. I mean, God, you can do exceedingly abundantly above anything we could ever imagine. And so we do just pray for a Super Bowl in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys don't have any faith today. I just felt the faith in the room just be sucked out. And uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 36. One day, uh, or one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and he sat down to eat. Now, just so you know, uh, in, the, in this environment, in this day and age, a dinner wasn't just like two people having dinner together. Dinners were parties. Dinners were a big deal. Dinners were uh, maybe more fun than our dinners would be uh, today. They were having a party. And so one of the Pharisees, Simon, in fact, asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home, sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city which is a nice way to say a prostitute, uh, heard that he was eating there. She brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with with expensive perfume. And then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man, talking about Jesus, were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Don't you love that part? Isn't that amazing? He thought to himself, if he only knew, if he was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman she is. And Jesus answers his thoughts. Imagine how he felt when Jesus was like, yo, I heard what you just thought. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. I love how Jesus does this. If he wants to teach something, he usually will tell a story, try to make it make sense to sometimes our stubborn minds. Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, well, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon. Now, I I think that it's important when we read the Bible that we try to dive in 
to the, the, to the scene as much as we possibly can to catch the magnitude and to catch the meaning of, of the scene. And, and Jesus is just so, so pause right here in this, in this story and just catch up with me on what's happening if you tuned out. What's happening right now is there's a party going on and there's Pharisees at the party. Pharisees are religious leaders. They were upstanding people who followed the law very closely. There are Pharisees there. But there's also this certain immoral woman there. She was known for her sinfulness, and she enters the party. She kneels down at the feet of the teacher, the star of the show, the most important person at the party, the most unimportant person there, the most, on the external, worthless person there, kneeling at the feet of the person there that was worth the most, God himself, and she's weeping while everybody else is partying. So just don't, don't just skip over the, the scripture and, and miss what is going on in this scene. There is, there is so much grief in this woman. There is so much shame in this woman. There is so much guilt in this woman that in, a, in the atmosphere of a party, she's at his feet weeping. And she would be a woman that was not supposed to let her hair down, but she's let her hair down, which would have been undignified in this day and age. And now her hair's down, and she's drying his feet, which were wet from her tears, with her hair. And as Simon is judgmentally thinking, if he only knew who she was, Jesus answers his thought and tells him this story. After the story, he turns to the woman. It says specifically, he turns to the woman, and I imagine watching her still weeping, washing his feet with her tears and with her hair and anointing his feet with this extremely expensive perfume. Now he's talking to Simon. I love Jesus because he's giving her the dignity of looking at her while he's talking to Simon, not even looking at him. He's looking at the woman, talking to Simon. Looking at the woman, talking to Simon, and he says, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, imagine this. He's talking to Simon, not even giving him the dignity of looking at him. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, from, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. Simon, you neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So, everybody say so. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said, to the woman, now that he's done rebuking Simon, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is an incredible story. It's a story of a woman who was so deep in a life of Sin that she doesn't even feel worthy to be with Jesus. She's knelt at his feet with her hair down, weeping. She is pouring out expensive perfume. Why? Because she understands that she doesn't deserve to be forgiven, but that Jesus has forgiven her. And so she can't do enough to pour her life back out in response to the forgiveness that Jesus has shown her. In the same scene, you can see the religious people, and you can find yourself in this story because you might be Simon the Pharisee, or you might be the woman, or one day you might feel like the Pharisee, and one day you might feel like the woman. We can all find ourselves in this story, but you've got Pharisees who are judging her and judging Jesus for how he treats her, and you've got a woman who understands her sinfulness, but also understands what Jesus has done for her, and you have a Jesus who is rebuking the judgmental ones, but comforting the one that is pouring herself out at his feet. This is really a picture of the gospel. 
It's a picture of the gospel. And it's what I want to talk about today as we're talking about this whole concept of love and answering the question, do I deserve love? Do I deserve love? Let me go ahead and give you the answer. The answer is no. You don't. And no, I don't. But Jesus has loved us anyway. And here's the spoiler. Because Jesus loved us and we don't deserve it, there is nobody that can disqualify themselves from God's love and therefore our love. The spoiler is that Christians love differently and more extravagantly and more extremely and more illogically than anybody else because of the way that we've been loved. We have the ability to love beyond what our natural selves can do. We have a supernatural ability to love exceedingly and abundantly because of the love that we've received. Yesterday, we had our first um, flag football game, and both of my sons are playing flag football. Judah, my five-year-old son, not coaching him, they're instructional league and they don't keep score. So I was like, forget it, not coaching him. Um, and, and, and Roman is in, in, in the six and seven-year-old league where they keep score, so I'm coaching his team. And uh, so yesterday was our first game. Now, uh, I coached in the fall, and we had um, a, a pretty good team, and we, we had a pretty good season. And then this spring, we uh, drafted a new team, and so we've got this new team, and we've had about six practices leading up to the, to the year. And I was getting really excited because – in practice, these kids were killing it, and I was getting excited thinking, man, we might take it all this year. I mean, we might win the whole thing this year, and I, I was excited. We'd scrimmage each other, and the kids were pulling flags. You know, they, we were scoring touchdowns, and uh, so I'm, I'm really confident going into the first game. First game yesterday, we are playing the defending champs, the Bills, the rookie Bills, and um, the rookie Bills are good. Their kids are big, but I was feeling confident. The game starts, and first play of the game, the other team scores. And uh, I'm thinking, well, we're going to come back and we're going to answer them. But no, they pulled our flags three times before we hit the midfield line, so they got the ball back. Next play, the other team scores. And I'll just, I'll just shorten the story for you. By halftime, they stopped keeping score because of the mercy rule. Now, I didn't know that they had the mercy rule, but I was pretty upset that they had mercy rule because I do believe in keeping score. Uh, but at halftime, we were losing so badly, they, they, they stopped keeping score. Here's what I learned. My problem was I was judging our team. I was comparing our team up until the first game to themselves. Got a little overconfident because I realized that our offense was scoring on our own defense when they were scoring in the scrimmage, and our defense was pulling the flags of our own offense when they were pulling flags in the scrimmage, and when we came to game one, we got a little rude awakening. And um, so I was mad yesterday. I almost didn't preach today. I um, was trying to get over all of my anger, so I decided instead of being mad and not preaching, I'll just, put the, I'll just put the story in my sermon and use it for good or something. I like to teach the kids, you know, not only do we like to win, it's hard in 2019 as the coach, me and Thomas are coaching, Thomas our campus director here, we, we, it's hard to like try not to offend people, you know, you don't know what people think, we're like, and I'm always like trying to kind of drop hints to the, to the parents, like, we love to win, like, we do care if we win or lose, but, you know, other coaches are like, it's okay, kids, it doesn't matter, and I'm like, no, it does matter, it really does, but it's okay, you know, but I like to teach them, here's the thing, I like to win, and I like to teach the kids to want to win, but I also like if we lose to be able to teach them how to lose, that's why I think it's important. If they never win or lose, then you don't teach them that winning is good and they don't learn how to lose. And so when they don't get the job, they think that the world should stop and whatever. But anyways, I step off my soapbox now. Um, so I, I, I knelt down, you know, to my son Roman and I was like teaching him how to lose. I'm like, son, here's the thing. It's okay. Um, they were paying the refs. And... I'm just kidding. I didn't say that. I knelt down to him, and I was like, they, they rigged the draft, buddy. They rigged the draft, and that's why we lost, and you just remember that, all right? And so, <laughs> no, but the problem was I, was I was comparing our team to the wrong thing. Here's the thing about life is you have to be careful that you don't compare yourself to the wrong thing. It's dangerous to compare yourself 
to the wrong thing. We do this all the time in life. Social media is really bad. It, makes, it gives us a great opportunity to, to, to compare ourselves to the, the wrong thing. It, you, can, you can see it when it comes to comparing our success with other people's success. Do you know that if you compare your success to somebody else's success, you are automatically setting yourself up for failure? Because to, only two things can happen. There is no middle ground. The only thing that can happen is you compare your life to somebody else's life, and because you're more successful than them, you feel good about yourself and become prideful and even complacent about getting any better. Or the other scenario is you compare yourself to somebody better and you become discouraged not, and feeling bad and feeling guilty and feeling like you're not good enough and it ends up not making you not want to get any better. And there really is no middle ground. There's, I teach it to our interns all the time. There is no such thing as comparing yourself to somebody else and being like, man, I feel good about myself. I feel good about myself. I, I feel challenged. I feel like I want to get better. It never happens. You're either going to Get complacent because you're better than them, or you're going to get discouraged because you're not as good at, at, as them. It's the danger of social media. You're looking at something that's not even real. You're looking at a picture that they've taken. That was their 15th picture with the perfect filter. And the Insta stories, they seem so real, but let's be honest. Like, you tried 20 times to make that seem unplanned. <laughs> like, oh, oh, hey, everybody. I'm just like, whatever. You know, my life's awesome. Now, that was their 20th time recording that video. And you can, you can end up feeling bad about yourself because you're comparing yourself to other people. We cannot compare ourselves to other people in our spiritual lives. And this is really what I want to talk about in our faith. A lot of times we as Christians, we determine or we assess our own faith journey against somebody else's faith journey. We assess our own spirituality based on other people's spirituality. And so if, if I seem like I have it more together than the other people around me, then I feel good about my faith. If I walk into a place and I feel like everybody else has it together and I'm the only one who doesn't have it together, I can get depressed and anxious about my life. As a church, we don't want to create an environment where people walk in and they feel like everybody has it together. That's why it's like, come as you are. We're normal. We try, to, we try to make sure that we exude this message that we are not better than anybody else. I'm not better than you because I'm on the stage with the microphone. We do want to be leading each other, and we do want to be getting better, and we do want to be one step ahead so that we can lead people to where we've been. But it's not a, I'm better than you thing, or I've been doing it longer than you, or you should feel like an outsider looking in. Come on, we're all in this thing together. And, and the danger of comparing yourself with somebody else is you're either going to get discouraged or you're going to get prideful. It's dangerous to compare yourself with the wrong thing. So what do you do, Josh? Who do you compare yourself to? You compare yourself. There's only one person that you can compare yourself to. And it's the person that Jesus has created you to be. The only comparison I should make, the only, the only person I should stand myself next to is Jesus. Because listen, as I stand myself next to Jesus, only there am I going to realize the depth of my sinfulness. But it's also there that I'm going to realize the magnitude of his forgiveness. That's better than you responded just now. It's only standing next to Jesus that I'm going to realize how sinful I actually am. But it's also right in that same place next to Jesus that I'm going to realize how forgiven I actually am. In that same place where I realize I'm not as good as I thought that I was. I'm not comparing myself to this other person who's struggling. That's why we look down so easily on other people because looking at their struggle makes us feel better about ours. Categorizing other people's struggle as worse than ours, it makes us feel better about ours. There should be no comparing in the church. There should be no comparing in the kingdom. And you don't have to, unfortunately, go very far to see people who compare. Even if it's not with words, with the way that they carry themselves or that, the arrogant persona that they carry around or the facade that they put on. We can be so quick to judge somebody else's struggle and not even see our own. So they can't break that addiction. And you wonder why they can't stir up the willpower to do it. But you eat whatever you want. You, you 
judge somebody else who struggles with their identity or their sexual identity, but you gossip about everybody. And so when you look at them with the side eye, the religious look, you can feel better about yourself. The problem is you were never called to compare yourself to them. You know what you need to do? You need to take a step off of your self-righteous throne and scoot over next to Jesus and realize that you're a sinner just like everybody else, but also realize that you're forgiven just like everybody else. See, and point number one is this, is that self-awareness reveals God's forgiveness. Our self-awareness reveals God's forgiveness. You have to understand this. You're only going to understand how forgiven you are when you understand how sinful you are. Now, this might seem depressing because I'm trying to, it's like, is he telling me how sinful I am? Yes, right now. But I'll get to the good part in a minute. But that's the cool thing about the gospel is that it's all of it. The gospel is so straightforward. The gospel is so black and white. The gospel is, yes, we are all sinners. None of us deserve love. But that's the amazing part about God is that he poured himself out and gave his best and gave us love when we didn't deserve it. And so, yes, you are a sinner. But, yes, you are redeemed. And the more you realize that we are lost, without him, the more excited you will be when you realize that you are found by him. We realize the level of our forgiveness when we can realize the level of our sinfulness. When Jesus says this, when Jesus is talking about the 500 piece debt versus the 50 piece debt, listen to me. He's not, you've missed the story and you've misunderstood what Jesus is saying, if you think that he's talking about categories of sinfulness, Jesus is not saying that there is a such thing as a 500-piece sinner and a 50-piece sinner. What Jesus is saying is that if you see yourself only as a 50-piece sinner, you're only going to give him 50-piece worship. If you only see yourself as a 50-piece sinner, then you're only going to give the world 50-piece love, 50-piece kindness, 50-piece acceptance. This is not that there is a 500-piece and there is a 50-piece. This is we are all 500-piece, but many times we mistake it, we get it wrong, and think of ourselves, but I'm only a 50-piece sinner. They seem like a 100. Because then that affects the way that you live the rest of your life. He says, this woman... And the reason that she is so extravagantly loving me and pouring herself out to me is because she knows how extravagant of a sinner she is. But you in your religious clothes, following the law, you think that you're better than her, and so you didn't even get out any water to wash the dust off my feet. Can I tell you, I almost called the message today 500 Peace Sinners. Can I tell you that we're all 500-piece sinners? But can I also tell you that you have 500-piece potential? That we have to realize, we got to get out of our little, like, you know, routine, going through the motions, treating church like some just little social club. Can we, can we realize that we were all dead and stuck in our sin, but Jesus came down and he rescued us when we didn't deserve it? And now our job, now our only response is to pour ourselves out. That's why we lift our hands and worship everybody. That's why we sing loud. That's why people talk back to the message and say amen and clap and go, woo. It's because we're excited that Jesus saved us. We're never going to make a difference in the world if you think that I'm just a 50-piece sinner. Because then you just think that you got 50-piece forgiveness and you're just going to give out a 50-piece life. I don't know anybody that gives out a 50-piece life. Is it 50-piece effort and 50-piece worship that makes a difference? I want to be a 500-piece worshiper, a 500-piece forgiver, a 500-piece Christian, a 500-piece lover. Come on, I want to be generous and extravagant with my life. Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers to ever live, said this. He said, it was the consciousness of great indebtedness which created the great love in the penitent woman. Not her sin, but the consciousness of her sin was the basis of her loving character. Come on, today I'm not telling you to just beat yourself up and feel awful about yourself because there is 
a good ending to the story. And we are redeemed and we're free and we're forgiven and we are righteous and we're holy, set apart, royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's people. But first, before we realize how redeemed and amazing we are, we have to be self-aware that we are 500 peace sinners. Point number two, God's forgiveness motivates our love. God's forgiveness motivates our love. Point number one is self-awareness reveals God's forgiveness. So we got to have the awareness, but point number two is then when we realize God's forgiveness, that's what motivates our love for other people. Listen, we love people according to the level that we've been loved. We love people at the level that we've been loved. Come on, this is just human nature. 1 John 4, 19 says this simple line. We love because he first loved us. We love because he first loved us. This is just, this is human nature. Think of, think of this. If you go to Chick-fil-A and somebody buys your meal, come on, how many know you're more likely to just pay for the person behind you because you were planning on paying for your meal? And when you got your meal paid for, you're like, man, I'm feeling generous right now. I'm going to pay for the person behind me. And that's how you get those long string of everybody's paying for each other in the line. You know what I'm saying? That happens at Chick-fil-A a lot. It's because Chick-fil-A is awesome. I heard that the warrant in Chick-fil-A is closing down for a while to do renovations. I don't know what we're all going to do in the meantime. Hmm. Anyway. I'm waiting on the spicy nuggets. If they would just do spicy nuggets. They already do the spicy sandwich. Like, what's the big deal? Just do the spicy nuggets. So... If somebody pays for you, you're more like, but here's what you're not likely to do. You're not likely to be in the drive-thru at Chick-fil-A, pull up to the window, and they say, the person in front of you paid for your meal. And you go, all right, that's amazing. Um, I want to pay for the person behind me their kid's college tuition. <laughs> Nobody's ever going to do that. If they pay for your meal, you're probably going to pay for theirs. And to, to prove my point even further, if they pay for your $5 meal and you ask what the bill is for the car behind you and it's a $40 because they're rolling six deep like my family, you're probably going to be like, I'm good. Because <laughs> I just got a $5 blessing. I'm not trying to, you know, I'll be down $35 if I. It's just in us to love according to the level that we've been loved which is why it's so important that we have some awareness and realize the, the amount that God has forgiven us. Because when we can realize how much he's forgiven us, it changes the way that we love other people. I wanna have a church that loves everybody, where everybody's accepted, always. It's in our vision, a love that's so dynamic that even the skeptic is drawn to it. I want a love that is so strong that somebody can walk in and say, I don't even know if I believe this whole thing yet, but I'm drawn to what is going on because of the love that I feel. That's the love of Jesus. To have a place where it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter where you come from, you're welcome here because we are you. Worst case, we were I mean, best case, we were you. A lot of people here are still you. <laughs> hey, let me talk to the Christians for, I've been a Christian for a minute. Let me talk to you. That's why it's important that you never get too far away from your conversion moment, from your salvation moment, that you never get so far away that it becomes a distant memory to you. That, that's why Jesus told his followers, like, this meal, this Passover meal, like, they, they had already been taking, they'd already been celebrating Passover for hundreds of years, and he doubles down on it. He says, continue to do it, but now you're not going to be drinking the wine, celebrating the lamb's blood that was over the doorpost. You're going to be celebrating my blood that's about to be shed for you. Continue to do this in remembrance of me. Why do we take communion? Why do we celebrate? Why do we worship? Why do we come together every Sunday? It's so that we can always remember what Jesus has done. Let us never graduate and get so deep and get so complex that we forget that we are here to celebrate Jesus and the cross, Christ crucified and resurrected. 
disappointed. Once we get distance, see, distance creates disinterest. Out of sight, out of mind is a real thing. And if you ever let your salvation moment get too far out of sight, it will become out of mind. And you will slip up and think that you're good enough on your own. Let us not get so far away from that moment that we forget who we once were. Because it's who we once were that's going to continue to motivate us to love the people who are at that same place that we were at. If you have Facebook, that'll... It'll take care of it sometimes for you with Facebook memories. <laughs> we were just talking about it this week. I was laughing with Suzanne. It's funny when something pops up from eight years ago, and you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> Recently, it happened to me. See, because I'm an OG Facebooker. you got to understand. I was in college when Facebook came out, and it came out for college students. So I'm in the, I'm in the original Facebook crew. And... Uh, and I remember, and Facebook reminded me recently uh, that when I first got it, one of the first pictures that I posted, and it just popped up on my Facebook recently, was me in a white short sleeve polo with my sleeves rolled up, <laughs> flexing with a flip phone clipped to my belt. And I said, my God, I'm a 500 piece loser. I made that up just now. 500 piece loser, I just thought of that. It's funny, right? Don't ever forget where you've come from because the level of your forgiveness is what motivates your love. And the third point is this. Our love leads to our service. Our love leads to our service. See, all these build on each other. Self-awareness is what reveals God's forgiveness. God's forgiveness is what motivates our love for him and for others. And it's that love right there. It's that love that drives, that spurs on, that causes us to serve other people and to serve God. The religious leader asked Jesus, what's the most important commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, and your mind. And equally as important, love your neighbor as yourself. Our forgiveness translates what, us being loved by God what does it cause us to do it causes us to pour ourselves back out to God That's what Sundays are all about is worshiping God and giving God back of our own lives in every way that we can and that's why we worship and give him our life that's why we lift our hands that's why we talk that's why we that's why we uh, speak that's why we sing that's why we give because it's a time where we come together and we say we're going to give our lives back. But also then that works itself out to other people. So we're going to serve others. We're going to give to others. We're going to love others. This Saturday is a time where we can put that practically into action. What do I do in response to the amazing love that God has shown me? Let me just simply serve the community. Be his hands and his feet and serve others. Jesus says this in Matthew 25. He said, he says, when you give someone a drink that needs a drink, when you give somebody food that needs food, when you give somebody shelter that needs shelter, when you give somebody clothes that needs clothes, you're doing that to me. And he says, and you're going to ask, how am I doing it to you if I do it for others? And he says, well, when you do it to the least of these, you've done it to me. How do we pour the perfume out? on Jesus' feet when Jesus is not physically, tangibly sitting here in front of us. How do you do it? You serve people. You love people. You extravagantly give to people. You pour your life back out because when you do that, you're doing it unto him. You're doing it unto him. And extravagant forgiveness motivates us to extravagant love. We love, because I love what it says. It says, Jesus says, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. And I had you repeat this word, so, 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 she has shown me much love. The reason we love big is because we've been loved big. The reason we love extravagantly, and we've been loved extravagantly. The reason we give extravagantly is because we've been given to extravagantly. 
That bottle of perfume, by the way, was not just like some axe body spray or something. They said, uh, scholars would say that this would be like 300 denarii. This would be like a year's wage. This would be 50, 60, 70 thousand dollar bottle of perfume that she poured out. That shows me the level that she understood her forgiveness. My prayer, God, is that we understand where you've brought us from. My prayer for you today is that you'll understand the level of his forgiveness and then that you'll respond with an extravagant level of service and of love and of worship. Our first value as a church is a heart after God. I see a church that is so dynamic that we can't be ignored. That's the church that I envision. I, but we can never get there if we're, if we're just thinking that we got here on our own. Let's, let's re-realize today. Come on, can you, can you re-realize with me? Come on, everybody in this room, can you, you might be in your lowest point, but if you're not at your lowest point, can you imagine with me your lowest point? Can you remember your lowest point? Can you do this? Maybe you're so far that you can't remember. Can you imagine where you would be without Jesus? Come on, so I heard a preacher say one time, the most powerful thing you can do to keep your relationship with God fresh is to remember where you would be right now if it wasn't for the grace of God. Come on, let's re-realize. Let's re who we would be without the mercy and the grace of God so that that can translate into a church that is so passionate and so loving and so kind and so accepting and so worshipful that we can't help but make a difference. Jesus said, Jesus said this, I closed with this scripture. He said in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world, the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, everybody say in the same way. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see. So that what? So that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Why in the world do we give? Why in the world do we love? Why in the world do we serve other people? Why do we want to live lives that serve our community, that serve other people? Because when they see us doing that, they wonder, why would somebody do that? Why would somebody do something as extreme as paying for the college tuition of the person in the drive through behind them? That makes no sense. That makes no sense. And obviously I'm not talking about literally. I'm talking about this is what God has done for us. So why are they serving us? Why is a bunch of people gonna do improvements at the high school? When the high school, I mean, what is the point of us this Saturday making this a better place? Like, what is the point? What is the point of us going and serving people who we don't even know? What's the point? Well, when they ask the question, and that's the chance for Jesus to shine. Well, you don't really understand. It's not because we know you. It's not because that, that you've done anything for us. It's because Jesus has done something for us. And my Bible says, when I'm loved, then I love. I love because I'm loved. When it shines Jesus, it shows Jesus to a world that so desperately needs him. Can you stand to your feet? Close your eyes. Open your heart. Open your hands. Lift your hands if you would, if you're comfortable. God, we open ourselves up to you. Come on, everybody. Let's open ourselves up to God in a new, in a fresh way. Come on, let's open our, open our hearts to him. Don't think about anything else right now. God, break our heart for what breaks yours. God, realign our perspective. Let us know that we don't deserve love, but you've given us love. And so those that we feel like don't deserve our attention or time, we're going to give it to them anyway because you gave it to us when we didn't deserve it. God, realign our lives, realign our perspectives. Those of us that have gotten caught up with ourself, with our own desires and our own needs so much that we can't stop and take some time so that we can't stop and understand, so that we can't stop and seek to empathize with somebody else and what they're going through. God, realign us, remind us of where we were 
and who we were. Give us a new perspective today so that we can be the church that you've called us to be. Compassionate, understanding, and loving, and generous, and accepting, and kind. This is who we want to be, God. And I pray that each person would leave here today more like you than when we walked in. Because we're reminded of what you have done for us.